subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates the ascendant quran an advanced english translation of the meanings of the quran once again uh, everybody uh, welcome to this webinar uh, brother muhammad let me start off uh, directly with you and this is a question that many uh, people have asked uh, they say that um, why another translation when we already have so many other Eng english translations are very well so perhaps you might want to address a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin was salatu was salam ala ashraf al mursalin wa khatam an nabiyyin al bashir al nadhir al siraj al munir wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man sara ala hudah it's a um, it's a great opportunity to be with you today those of you who are tuned in to explain uh, almost a lifetime of uh, innocent ambition to have the meanings of the Quran translated so that as much as we can uh, communicate these meanings without the uh, odd words or the uh, Shakespearean language or the Judeo-Christian terminologies and these other things. Like Brother Zafar mentioned, there are quite a few translations available. And we're talking, of course, <laughs> It's the Arabic origin, that's the Qur'an, inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiya. Verily, we have made this Qur'an accessible as an Arabic Qur'an. Now, I know some people, they get goosebumps uh, sometimes when uh, the word Arab or Arabic is used. Uh, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he revealed this Qur'an in the Arabic language, he did not reveal it to give any particular group of people any nationalistic or any ethnic superiority. So anyone who feels sensitivity or allergy to the word Arab or Arabic, uh, they should adjust that type of thinking. Uh, so this Quran, now we're speaking about its translation from the original Arabic text into the English language. Now I can't speak about translations because I know there's also plenty of translations of the ayat of the Quran, uh, their meanings into other languages. But a general, I think, impression is that there are the same uh, type of setbacks that in other languages that are similar to the setbacks of the English language when we translate the meanings from Arabic into English. I've, uh, I've gone through uh, some of these translations in English and Many years ago, I'm going back uh, maybe 40, 50 years ago, when I first began uh, reading the English translations, I realized that if I was a, only an English-speaking person, I knew nothing of Arabic, I'm reading here this English text, and then <clears throat> I'd say to myself, I don't know if this is that interesting. There may be some, obviously, because some translators, they really do a, an outstanding effort in translating some of the ayat of the Qur'an. But many other ayat in the Qur'an, in the process of translation, that <clears throat> pristine quality that is present in the original text, it just doesn't, it, it, the communication process cuts off. It cuts off because of 
uh, at least a few things. One of them is archaic language. Many of these translations, they have, uh, maybe I can later on give you a, a, an example and a comparison between the translation that yours truly uh, uh, accomplished and the other translations. And you can get a feel for the usage of what you may call outdated language, because some of these words, like uh, words you'll find in some of these translations, thou and thee and thine and lo and there, there's so, alhamdulillah, this translation has been uh, purged of what you may call Shakespearean language or ancient English or these things. So that that is one contribution that will help because translation is an attempt to lift the meanings from the original language into the language uh, into which the text is translated. Another issue that is of concern is not only the choice of word, but the style. There's uh, biblical terminology and many of our English translations, they are top heavy with the Judeo-Christian vocabulary. So uh, I, and I'll give you an example here. I don't want, you know, just to be speaking generalities. We have certain words in the Quran that are key words. It's necessary to understand these words to unlock other meanings pertaining to them. You take the word, uh, as an example, you take the word kafir. The word kafir is, is depending on the the translation that you are reading, it's translated as either an unbeliever or a disbeliever or an atheist or a sometimes polytheist uh, or a heathen and so forth and so on. It, it's these types of words that when when you use your daily language, how many times you can look at the past year, listen to people speaking the English language. When was the last time you heard in the day-to-day -day conversation, someone saying, oh, I just had a conversation with a heathen. It, it just doesn't exist. So that word, it, it, just by choosing to use that type of word, you had uh, the translator, and I appreciate, I'm not trying to knock down the translators. I'm sure in their own capacity, they tried their utmost best to deliver these meanings from English to Arabic. I, I have no doubts about that, most of these translators. Now, there are other types of translators who are Orientalists, and they'd love to use these types of words that will disconnect the reader of the Qur'an from the message or the meanings of the ayat. So in this, the translation, uh, the Ascendant Qur'an translation, you will not find these types of biblical choices of words. We tried our best uh, to cleanse the language and make it because the Quran is a functional book. It's not when when someone reads the Quran, we're we're not reading uh, lullaby chapters. We are not reading uh, you know chronicles of history. What we are reading is information that is infused into our daily lives. The Quran comes alive when the, its meanings become functional. And this is the dimension, more or less, this is the dimension 
that is absent from the translations that we have. So this effort, if, if we wanted to, to put it in a few words, this effort of the, the translation, the Ascendant Qur'an translation, is making the Qur'an communicative with the reader. So they, you say, oh, now I understand what this ayah means. Or now I understand what this short surah means. It, it's it, the, the fogginess that existed because of, o- only because of language itself, we try to dissipate it as much as is humanly possible. I have to mention here that when we're speaking about the translation of the ayat of the Qur'an, in a more accurate way, we should say the translation of what is understood of the meanings of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his words are so fertile that there is a gen- there's a generative process of meanings that occur when when operating minds are in contact and in touch with these ayat in the quran so to be conscious of this effort we say that we are translating what we understand to be the meaning or the meanings of this ayah or this surah. So this is your humble brother's understanding of these ayat. And I, I should I should also say here, I don't, I don't know if I'm preempting another question, but I should also say here that this effort, uh, this uh, first copy uh, that Brother Zafar mentioned has just been completed today, meaning it's off the press today and ready to to go out into the, to the whoever you know wants to have a copy. Uh, this is, I think, it came out to about one thousand one hundred and thirty pages, or in that area. And this translation has the the page of it has Arabic on one side. Uh, of the page, and then uh, corresponding to the ayah on the Arabic side of the page will be the English uh, translation of that ayah. So it's going to be Arabic and English, and it's going to amount to, as I said, 1130-odd pages. Now, there is uh, um, an effort to have another uh, copy of this translation meant for those who are not uh, very well versed uh, with, uh, let's say, Islamic terminology. So in that edition, we will have the Arabic omitted from the pages and just have the, the English uh, with here we are <clears throat> more or less conceding uh, a little just for the purpose of teaching or communicating, we will have the the anglicized words introduced into the translation. And what that means is if an, an average person who's in the English speaking world, a non-Muslim, what is, is curious because in our world today, there's a lot of question marks about Islam. There's a lot of curiosity about the Quran. And there's a lot of um, question marks about the Prophet and these things. And the average person is bombarded uh, 24-7 with misinformation <clears throat> and out and out lies about Islam and the Qur'an and the Prophet. 
So they are victimized. The average person, I'm speaking about the average person who's out there in the field or out there in the factory or wherever, and he hears all of this stuff about Islam and he wants to say, okay, well, let me get to the bottom of this. If a person really wants to understand Islam, they say, well, let's go to the, the holy book that these Muslims have. So if we give, if we make available for this average person, let's say um, a college level translation of the Quran, well, this person may have not graduated from college and he may not be familiar with some words. So we have to make it easier for that person to understand these ayat. So in this sense, we sacrifice, and I'll give you the example. Instead of saying Isa, you know, if we translated or transliterated the word Isa into English, of course, a Muslim would know who Isa is. But a non-Muslim would say, what's, he'll see the word I-S-A with the necessary diacritics. And say, I mean, this is becoming difficult for me to follow. So we don't want to put a word obstacle in his way. So we make it easier for him and we'll say Jesus. Because it's in reference to the same person. And the same thing with Musa. We'll say Moses. The same thing with Elias. We'll say Elijah. And so forth and so on. So that this person now can at least say to himself, oh, I can follow. I can read and follow what's being said here. There's no wording obstacle. And then maybe if Allah gives us enough effort and enough patience and endurance, um, somewhere down the road, months from now or a year from now or however long it may take, we may have another more simplified translation of the Quran. You may call it a translation for juniors. Our youthful generation who are still in high school or some of our uh, brothers and sisters in Islam or in humanity who didn't get the opportunity to go to school and are not familiar with refined words. Because if anyone is involved with a translation effort, they would understand that they are entering a jungle of synonyms. It's a jungle out there in the world of literature and words. And the, Qur the Quranic words, they have a, um, they have a, a tune-up to them. A Quranic word that is mentioned dozens of times or even hundreds of times in the Quran, the, the tune-up, the finessing of a particular word is done by the context that that word is in. So you can't take one word in the Quran, let's say the word Nasara, which generally is translated as Christians. You can't take that one word and every time you see it in the Quran, you automatically translate it as Christian. And this, unfortunately and regrettably, this is what has happened to many translators. They took one word and they used it consistently wherever it occurs in the Quran. And it occurs in different contexts with different uh, variables at work, and so it, it has to be uh, it has to be delivered in English with its present day equivalent, because we are living in a particular time that has uh, idioms to it. And now, as is the case with you know languages, uh, some of the words that we choose for our translation today. In a thousand years from now, because of the development of societies and because of the uh, of the progress in the human condition, uh, 
And because of the shifting of the usage of words throughout time, then there's going to have to be a crew of people just like us today who put our minds together and translate the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an into the um, mainstream terminology of the people of that time. And uh, that's why we need, we, uh, I'm not, I don't mean we, the Muslims only, we, the humans, the human occupants of the world, we need a communicative translation of the meanings of the ayat of the Qur'an. And we hope and we pray that this translation the Ascendant Qur'an translation will serve that purpose and you will not be, any reader of it, will not be alienated from at least the gist of the meaning of the ayah when reading this translation. If we, ha if we can accomplish that, then it's mission accomplished. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us the contribute what we hope we think is a significant contribution to the literature of translating the meanings of the guiding quran the ascendant quran an advanced english translation of the meanings of the quran